All right, I'm ready to read you Carlota chapter 16. <laughs> I'm actually really excited to read it. I, since I haven't read this before, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I kind of know what's going to happen from history, but not what's going to happen to our fictional character, Carlota. Late in the afternoon, it began to rain, a soft rain from the sea. We pulled our sombreros down over our eyes and huddled deep in our ponchos. The green flag got wet and hung down from its staff like a string. The canyon that ran westward out of the meadow was heavily wooded and narrow. A stream ran through it, and this we followed. Where the canyon suddenly widened, we found two old shacks connected by a portal that the Indians had abandoned. Here we tethered our horses and made ready for the, for the night. One of the men had lassoed a wild goat on our way down the canyon, so we all looked forward to something besides the jerky we had been eating. Vaqueros brought in armloads of dead manzanita roots and made a fire out of, <clears throat> out of the rain under the portal. My father skinned the goat and twisted the hind legs, folding them, back, folding them over the back, the front legs over the head, the whole thing he firmly worked down on a skewer, solid and flat. Then two vaqueros squatted opposite each other and turned the goat slowly over the fire. The Indians came riding into our camp while the goat was roasting. They brought word that the gringo soldiers were camped nearby, some in small tents and others without tents. How far, Don Andreas Pico said. Close, both of the Indians answered. How long on a horse? Part of the morning, said one of the Indians said. What part, large or small? Small, both of the Indians said. We were all sitting around the fire trying to dry out. Don Roberto said, the two trails, the one we traveled and the one the gringos travel, join here at the head of the meadow. The gringos are on their way to San Diego. They will need to pass this place to get there. Yes, there is no other trail, my father said. They must pass here. They have no choice. But what if the gringos are not going to San Diego? Don Andres Pico said. Where else, my father said. They do not travel just to travel. They are on their way somewhere. That place must be San Diego. There are American warships in the harbor at San Diego, one of the rancheros said. They are going there to meet the ships. They could be going to Pueblo, Los Angeles, Don Andres said. Not on this trail, my father answered. From the springs, they would have gone northward if they were going to the Pueblo. What happens if they want us to think that they are going to San Diego when they are not, when they are really going to Los Angeles or somewhere else, to Santa Barbara, perhaps? It was not settled where the gringos meant to go, but it was settled that they would need to pass the place where we were now camped. There was no other way out of the mountains. My father scraped some of the fat from the goat hide and fastened it on a stick and held it in the fire until it blazed. And then he put the fat over the turning goat and let it dribble and spread. The meat grew brown and crackled and gave off little spurts of fire. The rain had ceased, but wet fog had come. We could not see much beyond the ring of the fire. When the goat was done, each one of us took our knife and cut out a slice of meat. None of the men stood aside for me. I took my place with the others at the feast, which made me feel better. But no one had remembered to bring salt, so the meat tasted flat. It was good that my grandmother was not there. One of the vaqueros thought, thought he heard something and got up and left the fire. He was gone for a while and then came back and said, Nada and sat down. I would like to send someone up the trail to see what goes on with our gringo friends, Don Andres said, but he would lose himself in the fog and fall into trouble. They are where the Indians said they were, Don Roberto said. They do not like the fog much either. They see no better in the fog than we, my father said. It would be good, however, to know, said Don Andres, and perhaps from that what they intend. That night we kept the fire burning because it was cold. About midnight we all heard sounds in the brush. Two of the vaqueros and an Indian went around to, to, went out to look around. They were gone a long time, but when they came back they said they had found no signs of the enemy. We later learned that General Kearney had sent out a party to, to scout our camp. The sounds we heard in the brush were made by gringo scouts. When the vaqueros who went to see about the sounds came back, Don Andres got to his feet. He was tall and thin and had a pigtail, which he bound in a handkerchief. He looked serious in the firelight. He waited until everyone had quit talking. He said, We have been two parties. Now we are one, and I am the leader of the one. 
My commands are to be obeyed promptly without fail. Our lives and our fortunes depend upon it. The gringos will march in the morning, whether at sunup or afterward, there is no telling. We are to be prepared for both, all gear in readiness, the horses fed and saddled. Juan Aguilar carries a musket, which he can use if the opportunity arises. The rest of us will rely on our lances. He stopped to listen and we waited. One of our horses had gotten loose and was wandering around in the fog. Don Andreas said, we are outnumbered four to one. We must therefore strike fast and then retreat. Then turn at my signal and attack again, then again retreat. We have no need, I have no need to tell you how to use the lance. Being Spaniards, you know already, but it is well to remember that you ride low in the fashion of the Indians and strike for the body, for the body alone, two quick thrusts, more if possible. I was sitting across from the fire from Don Andres. Suddenly I felt cold, though the logs were glowing hot. Senorita, he said, looking down at me, there are seven horses to spare. These we will tie and put in your hands. You are to remain with them at a place I will show you in the morning. My father sat next to me, muffled in his poncho. He groaned as Don Andreas spoke to me. He was thinking of Carlos. He was sad beyond the use of words that his son was not there beside him, waiting for the dawn and the battle. Overhead, the fog had lifted a little. I could see racing clouds and a few stars. I was scared. I wondered if everyone else was scared too. Man, this is rather tense, isn't it? 